I would like to welcome everyone, even though some people are still coming in, because we have a really full program and I don't want to take any time away um, from this amazing presentation that um, we are so glad to see everyone here um, virtually, that is. So welcome to Low Connects Landscape Kimonos by Markow and Norris. Um, I am Jody Seifer. I'm the Curator of Education at the Lowe Art Museum. And again, I want to thank you all for attending and supporting the Lowe Art Museum. Um, um, we are going to ask that you please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation. Um, but we do invite you to type your questions into the chat during the presentation and we will be monitoring them. If they're not answered during the course of the presentation, we will try very hard to get to them. Um, but there, the presentation, there's a lot of really great slides. So we can't promise, but we hope to get to all your questions. So you can keep them coming during the presentation. And of course, we are recording this and it will be posted on YouTube um, a few days from now. So if you do not want to have your video on, you can feel free to turn that off um, as well. Um, I do want to let everyone know about our next program, which is March 4th. Um, it's at 6 p.m. instead of 5.30 p.m., but we're really excited to present um, Spotlight, Artists of Color in the Performing and Visual Arts, and we will be featuring contemporary artist Beverly McKeever um, and two of our own. Jody, you went on mute. Jody, you went Thank on you. mute. Thank you. I don't know if someone muted me. Sorry about that. So yes, we are excited to present Low Connect Spotlight Artists of, Artists of Color in the Performing and Visual Arts, March 4th at 6 p.m. And you can register for that on the Lowe's website if you just go to low.miami.edu. So please save the date for that. And of course, after this event, you will receive an email with a very short survey about tonight's event. And it really helps if you'll take just a few moments to fill it out. Um, it really helps support the low and for grant purposes. And we really do read them. So we hope that you will fill that out. Um, and I would like to thank the entire staff at the low for all their work on this event. And thank you to for the support of the University of Miami, um, especially from the Executive Vice President and Provost Jeffrey Dwork and Dean Bacchus, as well as our Director Jill Dupee. And of course, we would not be here tonight without the generosity of Robert and Florence Werner for lending the low the summer zenith kimono by Markow and Norris. And we would like to recognize Florence, whom we lost this past June. And I would like to express my personal sympathies to the family. Um, who I know um, many of them are with us tonight. And I would like to thank Robert Werner, who I believe is with us tonight as well. And finally, I would like to thank Eric and Tom. And I would like to now formally introduce them and then give the mic over to them. So I'm putting the uh, present the bio right here on the screen for you to read along if you need to, as well as for the recording. So Eric and Tom Norris developed their own process of weaving glass at the turn of the 21st century. After a decade of stained glass, Markow and Norris debuted one of their first woven sculptures in 2003 at the Bullseye Connection Gallery in Portland, Oregon. And their first public show was in 2004 in Baltimore, Maryland. Since their debut, over 50 publications and news outlets have covered their story and pictured their unusually complex sculptures, including Smithsonian Associates, Southern Living, Rob Report, Interior Design, Palm Beach Illustrated, Luxury Living, and The Washington Post. They have been featured on television on CBS Sunday Morning and Fox Morning News, among many others. Both artists have science degrees outside the arts, which help bring their other disciplines, bring other disciplines to their enigmatic creations. They have exhibited many cities, including New York, Miami, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Austin, and Chicago at SOFA. Mark Allen Norris live in Bowie, Maryland. So I would really like to thank both Eric and Tom for their generosity and for being here tonight. And I will like you to join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Jody. Can everybody hear us? I see some claps. Thank you. That's very Hi, nice everyone. of you. Hi, everyone. Oh, we can see a lot of you now. That's great. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for the um, 
uh, thanks for the love. We love you all back. We do want to thank the Low for inviting us to do this, and uh, Jody, and especially for to thank Bob and Florence Werner for uh, purchasing the kimono and then now loaning it to the Low so that everyone can see uh, her uh, on display. So I'm going to get started right away with share screen. Let's see. There we go. Just click on it. And then click okay. share. There you go. And all right, that is. Okay. All right. Can everybody see? All right, here we go. So we're going to. We're going to briefly um, go through a little bit of our early history and give you a little bit of, uh, of our background and uh, talk about the first kimono and, and a lot of the processes and the components that we make to create the kimono. We're going to skip a lot of big chunks of what we've done in our early time just because we don't have enough. That's good for another uh, uh, talk. Um, and the first two kimonos we created in our home in And falls out space time direction. And we really want to share um, this as a journey. Um, and, you know, with all journeys, you have to start somewhere. Uh, this is a very young me. This is 27 years ago uh, when Tom and I first started working on art. And you can see in the background the teeny tiny little cabinet with glass. We had about nine sheets of, of glass there. Um, and if you if you uh, stick with glass art for 27 years, it might look like this. <laughs> so we uh, we we've, we've created quite a bit of a of a selection now for us to choose from. So, but back to the beginning, we um, Eric's first stained glass piece he ever made was this little bird, and uh, just made out of four pieces. And one day I, in the studio, I found it in the recycle bin, and I said, "Why is this here?" And Eric said, "Well, we don't need that. We'll throw it away." I said, "No, we're not throwing it away." I didn't think away. it was a good reflection of um, those initial <laughs> glass cutting skills. But I kept it. We I made a necklace out of it. It's hanging on our one of our mannequins in our studio. So so he's got to remind us where we started. Um, uh, so Tom and I first started um, as stained glass artist, and so this is a picture um, of me here in the torpedo factory. And what we would do is we would show the process of, of creating these stained glass pieces um, to the public. And the Torpedo Factory is a glass uh, and art center in um, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, here's a picture of um, us putting the stained glass together, actually soldering it together. And one thing we wanted to point out is that, you know, it, very interesting glass was always something that we strive for. And you can even see in there the piece we used um, glass geodes and everything. This piece here is called Wild Root. Uh, this is called Wild Growth, Wild Hearts. Um, it sets in the West. And so, as you can see, our pieces are very organic. Um, they really colorful. focus on the glass uh, and the actual color of the glass rather than necessarily trying to create. Um, a specific um, image. So we'll get through those. While we were doing stained glass, there was an exhibit in Baltimore by Ichiku Kuboto of landscape kimonos, and they were fabric, and they took each of them took a year to make of seamstresses, seamstresses, both men and women, in uh, in Japan um, to to cre create these, and we were so impressed by them, but. We, we bought the poster, we've always remembered that. And we thought, well, you know, it's, at some point in the future when, when our, we develop different art techniques, maybe we can do that. So we kept doing stained glass for another uh, decade. This is one of the largest windows we did in uh, DC. And uh, it's uh, two big, huge transom windows. They're five feet across and five feet high. So it's a 10 foot wide uh, sculpture called uh, Maui Sunrise. And with everything we do, we kept pushing ourselves to do bigger and bigger. And this is probably, I would say, the biggest yeah, stained glass piece stained glass that pieces. we did. Yep. And then this was the first kiln that I bought for Eric for Christmas on 2002. And we just hooked it up in our garage. And our, our goal was to make glass for the stained glass. So instead of buying these individual pieces of glass and cutting them up, we wanted to melt our own glass together to, to make it. But once we started playing with the glass, um, warm, we really never went back to stained glass. We immediately thought to ourselves, why don't we 
try to make a basket out of glass. So the, this is the actual first piece that we attempted this where we just simply took little threads of glass in long strips, cut them into squares and alternated them. And although from a distance, it looks like a weave, we could tell the weave really eluded us. It was just a, a pattern there. So we embarked on a long journey, uh, a few years to figure out how to do uh, a weave. And we, we did figure this out. Um, and then we got an opportunity to do a show in Baltimore and we thought, well, let's just apply. We didn't really know what we were doing. We took these really bad pictures of this glass uh, blanket that we made and it was even broken. Um, but this is a good lesson to all the artists out there that photography is really key uh, and having good photography because here's the difference uh, when you have a really good photographer taking a shot of your work. So this piece, we had figured out how to make the glass and weave it on top of a, a sheet of glass to give it some strength. And even back then, so this was like, um, what you know, very magical for us because uh, woven glass wasn't something that um, had ever been done before. And, and so it really captivated a lot of imagination from people um, and we got a lot of interest in it. And our first, this was the first show in Baltimore. Again, we, we found these, uh, these, these walls that we could install and we had to make all this sculpture to put in the booth. And this is where our, our first magazine uh, found us and asked if they could write an article on us. And then we started doing shows where galleries uh, started picking us up. Now we're gonna jump way ahead to 2007 where we, uh, are, we, we, we did co different collections every year at these shows that we would do. And we wanted to do an origami collection that was a little different from our really, um, uh, organic shapes that we had done in the past. So we did this quick little sketch of, of origami sculptures that we might want to make in glass ending with the peace crane and the sunset kimono. So these are some examples of this was the Kogo Azure piece we made. And you can see how we have um, done a little origami piece. If you go to the, a, a little origami piece and then done the sculpture based on that. But and, inspirational. Yeah. This is called Eastern Sunset. This one's called red, here's inside red. And then we, our peace cranes were what we wanted to debut at that show with the origami. We always had that in the back of our mind about the kimonos, but we hadn't figured out how to do that yet. So uh, there's a folded peace crane and this one is three feet uh, wide uh, and it hangs um, or it's on a stand. Um, and this one's a, a, a rainbow peace crane and they are hanging in our entryway uh, in our home. And this is an example of them as you come down our staircase. And the, co the cool thing about the rainbow one is we actually folded a piece of rainbow um, paper um, to make sure we knew exactly where all the colors would line up if someone really folded. A giant piece of, uh, of glass fabric, that's right. So uh, let's, whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. My, my, there we go, my mouse is reversed, here we go. So that's looking through to our gallery, our dragonflies in there in our home. We often do tours in our home. So now we are, uh, there's the sunset kimono and we did some color stories on how to, maybe some color, uh, how we would want to do a sunset. Just to kind sunset. of see how the colors would come together in that very iconic um, uh, kimono sort of shape. And we even would, we do these paper mock-ups and we would just sit with those for a long time. But when we get out the foil, we know we're serious and we're really getting, uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna make this happen. So we we got the foil out, we invited our best friend, uh, Nancy Weiser, who uh, we eventually did the show with, this first kimono with. She came down and modeled the, the, uh, the foil for us. And this is how we can figure out how big we can make, make each of the pieces of the kimono. Cause uh, if they get too large, they're, they're, they can break. So there's a certain limit that we can get to. Um, and we did get our, the skirt pieces are 33 inches long. So we got them quite uh, large. So then we do a sketch. Yeah, here's the sketch of the autumn sunset uh, kimono. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have the sketch of the front. Um, we have sun rays coming in. Um, we have the, the sunset transitions through the skies. Um, and then on the back side, on the right hand side of the screen, um, you see the back of the kimono where we have um, the evergreen trees mapped out, the, the mountains. We really wanted to reflect those um, autumn colors and the leaves. 
So then we have you have to we have to make a, a mannequin that it, that can support all the weight. There's 125 pounds of glass. So we created this mannequin. Now this mannequin is in our studio, and it, we have our hot working materials on top of it. That isn't wasn't under the mannequin, but um, we scaled the mannequin down after we made the first one, so that because we knew we didn't need all that metal, but we needed to see the first one done before we knew we could scale it down. So this is what it looks like uh, underneath, sort of like a little. Uh, um, um, uh, just a support structure. So then we have to make the the uh, kimono. So we we refer to our glass supply here, and we want to make uh, lots of different colors that we can't buy commercially. So the first thing we do a, a really big step here in our process because you'll notice a lot of our pieces have lots of color in it. That's one of our signatures, and so we will literally create hundreds and hundreds of different glass colors. And we do that by layering different kinds of glass, um, adding powders to the glass, um, using different kinds of reactions. And we will, you know, code them all, make sure we can reproduce the formula of them. Um, and then we will go ahead and add heat, um, fuse the pieces of glass together, see what kind of reactions we're gonna get um, and you can see there in that yellow piece on the screen, that's an actual silver fo foil um, fuming technique we use to get a, a nice fuming color. Um, these pieces show um, how we've added a little bit of um, glass powder to get the effect. And then we kind of put them all together. The ones that we think are the really great colors will start to create a color story um, for you know the different uh, colors that we want to use in, in our pieces. Um, here we're showing how we're actually making some of those interesting colors. And it shows here how we're using a strainer with the glass powder and pieces to kind of sift out um, a nice layer of color. Um, Tom is- And don't do what I'm doing there. I'm crushing glass <laughs> with my bare hands that uh, those are glass straws. So either I've got a tool right there, but I don't know why I'm not using it, but um, it, it, uh, we just do that to add a lot of texture. Oh, there's the tool. It just uh, cuts them up and we just adds texture to the, uh, to the sheet of glass and adds a lot of extra color. And then we can and take that uh, and cut them into to, to squares. That's here, confetti. Yeah, here we're adding little um, thin pieces of, of, of glass that have actually been blown and crushed um, and just add another layer of texture and color to make that glass as interesting as possible. Even if it's gonna be stripped out, we want those strips to be as unique as possible. And Eric's put a sheet of glass on top of that so that we could then use both sides of the uh, glass. And then I'm putting it in the kiln right now, and then that'll cook up to uh, 1500 degrees to melt together, and then we'll have the color bars ready to go. And then there's a whole bunch of bars and color plates that we've made. And you can see all the samples that are on the table uh, that we, we used to test. And then we made the larger sample. And the other thing we have to do is cut them all up into strips so that we can store them and then use them when we're weaving. So here you see me using a tool to actually scratch the glass. And I'm scratching it in a line and then I take a pair of pliers and kind of bend along that line and it makes the glass break apart in that straight line. And then we get even finer and thinner in our pieces in order to do the weave. And um, so we've scored it again. Eric's got a really steady hand for that. And then this is a close up of that snap right there. If you, if you score it just right, there it goes. So there's an example of all the strips that we've made. So we've made those components. Um, and we're able to, to set those aside and store them. And the other component we have to do, here we are in a kiln, I mean, in our, with our kiln in our uh, studio. This, this picture was done for an ad for the Paragon company that makes our kilns. But the, you see the pots behind me on the shelf there. We have to pull threads so that we can use the warp in the weft uh, of the glass. So we take those pots and we put them in a kiln. This we're having a tour in our studio here in this shot. And we are, we put the flower pot full of glass in a kiln above our head. And then I, I'm releasing the, the plug there. And then the molten glass, it's 1700 degrees. It took several hours to get to that temperature. We, uh, we have to work out this uh, initial plug 
And then once we get that loose, uh, we can uh, start pulling through the hole in the bottom of the flower pot and pull threads. And we can pull them um, fast or slow, depending on how thick we want. Uh, and we're that, actually using the gravity to help us, you know, make it thin, make it straight. Yep, yeah, and this is uh, again in our old studio. And then so I can also stretch it, as you see me doing there, to make it a thinner piece. Uh, and then we uh, just pile them all up and uh, they're easier to store when they're um, straight like this uh, in, a, uh, in a bin. And it, and it takes about a half an hour to do an entire pot. You can see a bunch of pots there on the shelving. It takes about a half an hour to do, pull one of those and you have to continually pull. Um, if you don't, if you stop early, this is what happens. The, the glass that's left inside uh, cools faster than the ceramic and it will split. One of the cool things about this is we get to use our scrap glass. So we're, we're you know, we're not creating waste. Um, it'll, we can use the, you know, the scraps and pieces, charge the, the flower pots with them uh, and keep using all the scraps of glass. And this one, we use three different colors of glass to create this woodland brown color that we needed uh, for, uh, for, our, um, uh, for our sculptures that we were doing. Uh, so that's a close up of all the colors of glass that are inside there and coming out. The other thing we do with the Vitagraph kiln is that we um, make noodles, wide noodles, where we can add a lot of color to them in stripes. So we put these two strings on either side so we can guide ourselves as we're pulling it out of the kiln to keep it really straight. And that's the noodle left over. So it's, a, it's probably anywhere from a half inch to three quarters of an inch wide. And we're able to um, have that as a, as, a, as a texture rather than just simply strip cutting all of the, the bars that we made. And that's one of the pots taken out of the kiln. On the left side, it's inside the kiln and on the uh, outside, on the right side, it's the, at the end. And we're actually able to use that hole, change the hole in the bottom of the pot to give whatever shape of, um, the, noodle of, the, we of the noodle strand yeah. that we want. So this is, that's seven of our uh, nine kilns in our kiln room right now in our new studio. And then there's a whole bunch of the threads that we uh, have made. So, uh, you know, you, we've made the strips and we've made the bars and we made all the threads and, you know, you put all that in a box and shake it up and you get a kiln. Lots and lots of color. So <laughs> we, uh, but then part of, you know, making art is also um, marketing and doing shows and getting the, your art out there so that people can see it. And eventually the art can end up in collectors' homes. So while we were making our first kimono, um, we had to develop an ad campaign that we could market with. And so we, our graphic designer helped us. And uh, this is as, as time consuming sometimes as making the art. Uh, but we developed, we didn't know what the kimono was going to look like while we were making it, but we had to do this way ahead of time. So we had this graphic design made that sort of gave an idea of a landscape kimono, uh, but we wouldn't really know what it would look like. So, um, and even right up to the last minute, we, we set up our show at the Weiser Gallery in Maryland in 2009, and the sleeve of the kimono was not completed when the morning news show came to film us to, to promote the exhibit. So that piece, that shoulder was in the kiln until the morning of the opening reception. Nothing like waiting till the last minute. Right? And yeah, we, <laughs> we, we were just crossing our fingers that it wouldn't crack in the kiln, which can happen, but it had its final polish that we had to do uh, the morning of the, of the uh, show. So it was, uh, it was uh, fun to talk about why that, the, the kimono there did not have the sleeve, but we did have the opening reception at the Weiser Gallery and uh, we had both sleeves on the kimono and uh, we had a really great time. Now this picture is our studio, our former studio manager. She had not seen the kimono. She had, uh, was, had left us a year before we started the kimono. And when she saw it, she started crying and our photographer, Tony captured that. And it's always been really touching. So we hope that's okay, Cigna. We know, <laughs> you're, we know you're watching, but it was really, it's really moving to see uh, people uh, react to our, um, our sculpture. Well, it's, it's been such a fun. great feeling. I mean, the first time that, you know, you see someone get emotional when they look at your art, it's just very incredible. So it really moved us. It was really a, a fun, uh, a fun time. Uh, this was our first big exhibit with a, gr a great big sculpture like this. And we had, uh, we just had a really a great time. We had two opening receptions and uh, had a lot of turnout there. And it was just fun to see 
and talk to everybody about our sculpture. And because we finished the sculpture right before the show opened or you know, the morning of the show, we never were able to photograph the kimono. So we had to go in at night after the show, the opening reception was over and bring our photographer and he's in the back behind me, set up all the light boxes and do the um, photo shoot. So here's the photograph that we got of the kimono uh, once she was finished and actually on display in the gallery. And uh, she was really, uh, we, we just, she really, it was about 18 months to get her, to get her made. And um, yeah, a lot of love went into that. So now we're gonna skip really quickly right into the next kimono. Um, this is the winter twilight kimono. kimono. And, um, oh, did we say that the, it's, it's autumn sunset, which is, you know, fall and the sunset time. Winter twilight is midnight. Um, the next one will be spring dawn, which is morning, and then summer zenith is high noon. So it's four different seasons and four different times of day. Uh, and here's the back of the winter twilight kimono with the moon there. And then here's the bow. A lot of people ask us about the obi bow. We wanted a really dramatic origami looking obi bow. And so it's made out of five different sculptures uh, put together to make the, the bow on the back of each of them. We sort of wanted it to look like a butterfly. So again, we had to do uh, uh, an ad campaign to get ready for the Haven Gallery where we were gonna debut the second kimono. And, um, but this time we knew what the kimono was gonna look like. So we, you can see in the design there that we, you, we could put the mountainscape in her kimono, and, but we still wanted to draw uh, from the last poster uh, what the, uh, and have sort of similar similarities to the campaign. So this is her uh, displayed at the Haven Gallery. And what we did during the open reception there is we covered her up we had the opening reception. We were there visiting with everyone. And then we uh, unveiled her while everybody, once everybody got there. And so it was really fun. I, on, our, on our website, there's a, a video of us um, um, in, at the exhibit there. Um, so then we moved the kimono up to Aspen, Colorado. And it was perfect up there because Aspen was covered with snow and the winter twilight kimono looked phenomenal up there in that gallery. So we had a really uh, fun time, uh, a good excuse to go up there to Aspen. Now we did one fun thing with yeah. this. Uh, this was one of my favorite things that we've ever done. And so if you look at the moon, that circle um, in the back of, of the kimono, um, we actually added a very cool feature. So we put powder inside it that glows in the dark. You can see it's blue. So when the lights go out after it's been illuminated all day, in the collector's um, uh, pagoda where it is, uh, it, you, if you turn the lights out, it turn, it glows blue. So we were really, that was just kind of a fun, uh, a nice touch. And at the at the Haven Gallery, we did, we turned all the lights off in the gallery, told everyone to stand still, and we uh, we showed them the, the glow in the dark um, a moon. And that's actually on our website too, that clip of us doing that. So here we are in uh, Beverly Hills in the installation of the, uh, of the kimono. There's a pagoda built on their property for her. And it's really an absolutely stunning uh, room and setting for her. The pagoda opens up, uh, here we go. It opens up on good days. And if it's rainy, they can close it. But so she can actually look out uh, onto the gardens. Um, it's a really, really cool um, setting for it. This was our first selfie we ever took as Marco and Norris <laughs> and posted it on Facebook. Uh, this would have been 2000. And yeah, it was 10 like, or 11. Yeah. who knew that selfies would become such a big trend after <laughs> yeah, that? <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's it. Uh, so um, yeah, this is another shot of the uh, pagoda there. So then now we're on to our, our spring dawn kimono the next year. We were making one per year um, for the five years. And um, the first one took us 18 uh, months to do. So the spring dawn, the gallery wanted an idea of what we were gonna do. And we didn't know, but we did a sketch just to kind of get an idea of what it would be at the SOFA show in Chicago. SOFA stands for Sculptural Objects and Functional Art. It's a big show on the Navy Pier in Chicago uh, every year, and it's uh, quite well attended. So again, we're doing the same process where we do some sketches, figure out, you know, what is that landscape going to look like across the kimono, and then start to do, you know, the color stories. Um, we have a carpet wall in our studio and we actually use Velcro um, with these individual um, color tiles. And on the next slide, you'll see, you know, we, we just can't keep doing that and trying to look and see how do we want this color to come together with the landscapes. Um, here, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we've got Northern Lights, pictures of Northern Lights, trying to match the colors 
um, because we actually did have northern lights in the spring dawn kimono. Uh, and here we are, um, you know, mapping it out more on, on, the, on the storyboard. There's, yeah, we're having a tour, a Smithsonian tour here, and there we're showing everyone how we mapped out that kimono. More sheets of glass that we made. And the trees. Um, we actually, um, you know, create yeah. those trees in the glass. So this is the spring dawn kimono, and we wanted to do a nod. We put cherry trees throughout her, um, throughout the landscape here. And this is her obi bow. And you can, you notice up in the upper right hand corner that uh, gold mountain peak is actually has gold leaf in it. Now these are the cherry trees that we made for this. These were pretty complicated to uh, embed. We had to make, we made them separately. And then here, how, this is how we made them. We, you saw us pulling these little threads before. We pulled them like little sticks and then we would, uh, we cooked them in the kiln uh, to give like a tree base. And then we crushed pink powdered gla pink glass and sprinkled it on to give sort of the idea of a cherry blossom. And then we applied them to the glass uh, as we were uh, weaving it so that they could be, uh, they'd be permanently embedded in there. And the uh, Geta shoes at the original show uh, at Nancy Weiser's, uh, we wanted to cast the shoes that we bought in glass and we ran out of time and we couldn't even get the kimono done right until the very last minute, remember? So, but, so we used the real shoes and put them at the base and we actually realized that we loved the juxtaposition of the real shoes with the dress, the glass fabric dress. So from that point on, we bought the other pairs and each of the kimonos have an actual uh, real uh, uh, pair of uh, Geta shoes. And that's them close up. And then we love doing beading to give a little bit of extra texture to the um, some so we portions. We take little bits of glass and add heat so that they round out. Um, and it just gives a, a, a more texture, more color. So here's one of the sleeves of the summer zenith kimono. And then there's a peak of mountains that we just, we do put beads on there to kind of give it a silver peak. There's a close up there. And then remember, we made, remember that glass panel we made here? That's it embedded into the, uh, woven into the, um, to the, the sleeve. And we've cut out, instead of a strip, you know, we've cut out these uh, uh, chunks. Shapes, yeah, whoops, there we go. Represent the landscape. Yep, they represent the landscape. So then part of the journey is again, displaying the, the sculpture. So the Pismo Gallery um, took us to Sofa Chicago and we, uh, displayed the spring of uh, the spring dawn kimono there. Uh, this was in 2012, and we made this seven foot cherry blossom branch behind her uh, with 66 flowers on it to just accompany, uh, uh, to have a backdrop for her there. So the, uh, the sofa show is a three day weekend. Thousands of people come through the Navy Pier. It's really a, a phenomenal place to meet lots and lots of, uh, of art lovers. And we really have a great time. Uh, we, the few years we were there, we had a great time uh, showing our, our work there and meeting lots of people. This is the home that she went to in um, Indiana. And she has a gorgeous gardens to look out, uh, look over. As a backdrop. As a backdrop, yep. There's a, they have a gorgeous art collection in their home. So now we're at the spring, or the summer zenith kimono, which is the piece de resistance. So this and was probably our I mean, it was our final and probably most ambitious uh, kimono because of all the things we wanted to incorporate. We wanted to get the sun, the sun rays, waterfalls, water underneath the water. And then on the back of the kimono, we really wanted to feature that Mount Fuji, you know, which is very iconic for Japan, um, the great Obibo, and then uh, all these different swirls of water. So we had lots of glass to make to uh, be able to choose from. So we made, uh, gee, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know that we ever even counted them all, but uh, it was a, a lot, a lot of glass. <laughs> now, a lot of this time we don't use it all, but we wanna have it available if we need it. So lots of ideas for water and rocks and um, the eddies and the swirls and everything. Lots of silver foil you can see down here. We put the, a lot of the coloration around that silver foil is fuming each time we cook the glass, which gives it a different texture. Yeah, this piece really shows it good because, you know, we want to be able to show those waves splashing around um, and um, so that you can see the silver foil here. And as we heat it, it fumes out uh, if we use the right 
uh, glass elements. And here is the summer zenith kimono. You can see a lot of the swirls in here that we just showed you in the glass. That's and the back. Yeah, Mount Fuji is the entire length of the back of summer zenith kimono, starting right here, going up. And then here's the peak of Mount Fuji. And then it comes all the way back down to here. And we have, you know, rivers here, the rivers here, waterfalls coming down here into the, the water eddies, down into even coral down inside the water. And here's a close up of Mount Fuji where we use silver foil and fused it onto the glass and gold leaf uh, fused onto the glass to give a really nice uh, peak of both of those uh, uh, precious metals. And that's the front uh, with our sun rays coming across and the ocean. Here's the beach right here with waves breaking on the beach on this side. This, this kimono was um, probably the most uh, detailed landscape or the most realistic is what I mean. Um, so the sun here, we wanted to have the sun be really dramatic and have it have some texture and interest. And the first thing we tried was we did silver foil inside the kiln with another sheet of glass we were making. And during the heat up process, the glass split into three pieces. So this piece was, we couldn't use it. And we didn't really like the way the fuming was here. It didn't really seem like a sun to us. So we filled up a pot of glass here, a uh, flower pot with uh, uh, yellow, yellow glass. glass. We melted out the hole in the bottom of the pot and it turns into this disc. Well, that was sort of kind of, you know, flat. It didn't have a lot of texture to it. So we layered the glass inside the pot with white and yellow glass and it comes out and it kind of does its own little spiral twirl and you can see from the top here it literally makes these really great um, spiral shapes so that's it a little bit closer up and then that's the sun that we actually put in wove into the uh, into the kimono so then again we took uh, winter twilight or I'm sorry uh, summer zenith to uh, to sofa Chicago uh, we made a huge Tory arch out of uh, red feathers um, for a Tory is a bird perch. So we wanted to make feathers and make the Tory arch to go behind her. And this is where we met uh, Bob and Florence Werner was at the sofa show. Um, and it was so fun to get to chat with them and get to know them better. And um, I remember Florence going back and forth with Bob about where they would put the kimono in the home. And that's true. It's, uh, you know, they, she always requires a lot of space and um, it was really commanding of the, of the room. So the SOFA exhibit that show was that, uh, that year, it was 2013, a phenomenal time there. Again, we met, you know, hundreds of people, people throughout the exhibit weekend. And uh, it's really fun to just see people enjoying uh, what we spend all year um, doing. So. And we love showing it to people. And this is Nancy Weiser, who we did our first show with her with the first kimono. She and her husband Chuck came to, uh, they wanted to be at Sofa to see the, the last of the four kimonos on display. So uh, it was really great to spend the weekend with them uh, and walking the show. So here are the Werners in their home with uh, the kimono. And the first thing Florence did was she renamed Summer Zenith kimono Sunny Geisha. And we love that name. So Sunny Geisha is what, uh, is what we call her now. It was really, she gets phenomenal sun in the morning. She's sort of looking at the, um, the if, you have a con if you have a conversation there of people on the, the, the couch and sitting area there, she's involved in the conversation. It's really a great, uh, a beautiful location. And the uh, Florida Grand Opera uh, wanted to use the Werner's uh, kimono uh, on the cover of their magazine for, because they had Madame Butterfly was, uh, was one of the operas that year. And they did an article on uh, Bob and Florence and it was really, it's really lovely. It was really uh, uh, great for them to do that and a lot of fun. And then uh, when the Werners had an exhibit of their art, uh, their glass art in the uh, Low Art Museum, uh, we came down and uh, uh, moved her from the, uh, the Werners home uh, into the exhibit. And here we wanted to show how to turn it um, so that you could see the back side of it. And so all the, all the kimonos are able to spin um, in the way that we've designed them. And then we moved her to the Poly Pavilion uh, after the Werner exhibit was over. And this is where she is on display now. And anyone who's in the, at the low, it's the University of Miami in um, um, 
uh, south of Miami, uh, you can um, uh, go in and have a have a look at the the kimono. So we designed the kimonos with uh, to have a scenery that continues on all the way through. So the autumn sunset. I'm saying that wrong. No, that's right. We saved some of this glass here so we could put it in the winter twilight. And then we saved some of the winter twilight glass here to put in the spring dawn and the same thing here. And the back has the same, it's a different scene, but uh, it still continues the same way. You can see some of the autumn sunset colors here and we continued them through. So we, wanted to show you our next thing that we're, our next project that we're doing and it's our samurai. So as I said before, if we get the foil out, we're serious. <laughs> so we are, our next, uh, our next idea is five samurai, life-size samurai. Uh, he is seven and a half feet tall. We'll, we'll, we'll show you how much we've done on him. But um, we, we were better at the foil pattering this time because we sort of knew what we were doing. There's a kilt behind there that was work, we were working on for um, a client in Richmond. And that was another fun project. Uh, so the samurai. So just like the um, kimonos were sort of focused on the landscape and the seasons, we wanted to do something a little different with the samurai and um, have each of them represent a feng shui element and also have a fierce uh, iconic animal represented in them and a flower of some kind. So this so sort of have the yin and the yang. Yep, the first one here was a dragon and the sunflower were the two uh, symbols that we used. So we had to do a really detailed sketch. The Smithsonian Associates wanted to do a tour and they wanted to put a picture of the samurai, what we were working on in the their magazine. So we had to do a really detailed sketch of the samurai. So they had an idea because we didn't have the samurai uh, finished. And then we did our color story here where we make this the samples. We figure out which colors we're gonna wanna put together to, uh, to make the larger sheets. And then here is the kimono, the, the uh, samurai. He's not quite finished, but he's the fire samurai. Um, we still have his face to Finish. He'll have a mask and he'll have a, a, a neck guard here. We still have Eric's feet to cast. They're in wax now. They'll be in glass when we're done. Uh, so there's a few more things that we have to do. Um, here's the close up of his chest. Here's the tail of the dragon and the sunflower. And then the sunflower continues through the shoulder uh, plate. And then here's the side. And then the back of him, here's the dragon's head. And we still have a yellow cast dragon we're gonna put in the middle that faces forward in between the two flames. Here's the dragon's face up front. He's breathing out some fire and he's holding onto a sunflower in his claws. Now here's the close-up of the, of the uh, you can see his teeth here and his tongue is pink. And here's his uh, blowing out the fire. Um, another close-up, this dragon skin we made from scratch by using lots of silver foil and fuming to try to get this texture uh, to come out and look like this. Yeah, trying to get it as close to that, you know, rough dragon skin as possible. Yep, and so the flames here, um, they shoot out over the shoulder on the other side. And there's his helmet. So again, his face will be covered with a mask. Most samurais had a mask and he'll have a neck guard. This uh, sort of licorice rope was just there to kind of make him look finished for now, but we haven't finished him yet. And there'll be a yellow dragon poking out from between the two, uh, the blades here. Um, and uh, there we are again. Oh, there's the whole dragon, uh, front and back panels. You can see the tail and the, uh, the head of the dragon. So uh, Eric's hands we cast in glass. We often, you can even see the fingerprints. We often wonder if this would open his iPhone, but we haven't tried that yet. <laughs> the, uh, we, we've, um, so this is uh, the, and then this is Eric's feet. We cast them in wax. He's in a, 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 an Asian sandal. And then we'll cast this wax in glass. So it'll be, it'll be clear glass, just like that. That was very hard to do too. It was, yeah. It, um, was, it a, was hard to get my foot out. <laughs> yeah, once it was, this, the, the, the gel was set. So there he is again. So here's our color story for our other uh, four samurai. So as we said, we did one, we're, you know, we're planning to do one for each of the Feng Shui elements. So you saw the fire, we have the water samurai, which will also have uh, koi fish and, um, and the lotus flowers in it. 
the earth samurai will feature the tiger. Um, the wind samurai will feature the dragonfly and the cherry blossoms. Um, and then the sky samurai uh, will uh, have a hawk and an iris flower. And then back to the fire samurai, these were the color samples that we left up there. So we have um, the Smithsonian Associates, we mentioned the tours that we have with our home. They put the Spring Dawn Kimono on their cover of one of their magazines in 2013. And they, the, they organize all the tours in the area and sometimes out of, this town, out of the city um, of art artists and artist studios and art collections. So we always have a great time with them. We have a big, huge bus show up. It's 40 to 50 people. Um, this is one of the reasons we wanted to move is because our home in Falls Church was too small to accommodate you know, 50 people. We would have to break up the group into two groups, upstairs and downstairs. And now we can accommodate everybody um, in our, our home at once, which is really nice. Our, our studio here is 2,800 square feet. So it's, um, it's quite large and we were able to build it out just the way we wanted it. So there we are in our, our living room and in our family rooms here. We're looking out over our, um, our trees and we're, we're, we do a little bit of talk, a, a little bit of uh, introduction to uh, who we are and what we, uh, how we got started. Um, it's uh, always fun to meet everybody on these tours. Uh, then we move into our gallery. This is us showing our, dra our six foot dragonfly uh, to the group. Uh, then this is our gallery without anybody in it. We, we have a cactus, there's two uh, kites. kites. Here's a peacock feather um, down the hall. So uh, we change our gallery out quite regularly, which is fun. Now this is us debuting the Summer Zenith Kimono, which is at the Lowe Museum uh, to the Smithsonian group. We had it covered in, in a black fabric and then we unveiled her uh, for the group when they were there. Uh, and then uh, during the, the time that the groups are here, we do like little... to do some demonstrations yeah. of how we cut the glass, how we make, um, how we use the powders and things like that. And we just have, uh, have a great time with, they're usually there for two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, and we uh, just show them a lot of what we've shown you here. So um, our, our, we often have our nest babies, uh, uh, I, yeah, on the table there, I skipped through too fast. There are people used to ask us if we make any small sculpture. The only thing we make that's small are these nest babies. You can see we have 17 of them. They all have their own stories. They're on our website. Um, but uh, this is our two birds, Simon and Sydney. Uh, they're gone now, but they were 20 years old uh, when they uh, when they left us. But uh, we had a nice long life with them. It was really uh, delightful. Those are our so those are our nest babies there. So Jody, I think we are uh, at time. So what should uh, we can keep going we can on start things. taking questions? Oh, we, if you want. Yeah, we can take questions. Thank you both so much for such an amazing um, story of your journey and of your process. Uh, we have been monitoring the chat, and there are some questions, but I believe um, before we get to the questions, um, uh, Dr. Dupee, did you want to pass pass the uh, mic over to? Mr. Werner, I wasn't sure what Mr. Werner wanted to say something. So I, I would I would love to, but first I want to thank um, our guests, Marco and Norris, for an incredible um, 50 minutes, 45 minutes. I don't know. It feels like both, you know, one minute and three hours. I've been completely transported and I haven't smiled so much in a long time. So thank you. This is really thank very you. special. But I don't know that Bob Werner was able to join us. I know he had a conflict, so we'll we'll be happy to share the recording with him um, after the fact. But I do know that Ron, one of the Warner's children is uh, with us this evening and wanted to say a few words. So Hi, Ron, Ron, if you'd like to unmute the, uh, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, thanks for uh, giving me a minute. <clears throat> uh, to the low, thank you for hosting this. Gentlemen, um, I've never met you before. I've only um, heard about you from my parents. <clears throat> this was absolutely fascinating. Uh, particularly for a piece that I'm so intimate with, that I've spent so much time with her. We, of course, only know her as Geisha because that's how my late mother would speak of her. But to hear your interpretation and understanding how she was created uh, was very special. What really hit me um, was you talking about Mount Fuji. And as much time as I spent with this piece and literally morning, night, middle of the day, waking up in their apartment at three in the morning and walking around and taking that Miami moonlight in with it. I never really knew about Mount Fuji when my father 
was in the army in the Korean War, he was stationed in Japan. And one of the things he talks about is his climbing Mount Fuji. Um, so to... it, it's yeah, really that's... incredible. It actually, I think that's one of the reasons he was so connected to that piece. Yeah. It really makes it special. And you know, my, I think my parents have 400 plus pieces in the collection. Um, this was my mother's favorite piece. Wow. And uh, in fact, this year. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, this was her favorite. Ron, and that's we, um, wonderful. We was, it was, she was such a wonderful lady. Thank you. Uh, Jill was kind and opened up the museum for us on um, on July 12th, which would have been her 86th birthday. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so we, we honored her by being with the piece in the museum. But I just oh. want to say thank you. It was really, really special and beautiful. But your workmanship, the creativity, the execution, the really the science behind it is incredible. And it brings a whole new understanding to something that's so special. And, and I can tell you on behalf of my family, we're not only thrilled that my parents are being able to share their collection through the low with the world, but this piece in particular, being able to see so many people connected today and enjoying it really underscores the importance of art going into the public realm and not just being in the apartment. You know, we've had the privilege for years of living with their collection and enjoying the pieces, but opening up like this, I think just makes it so special. And I just really want to say thank you. Ron, thank you so much. That's so meaningful. We're so glad your parents uh, have some sunny geisha. That's great. And that's a great segue to say, you know, to, quest, to turn to the questions of everyone that is attending here, which uh, there are a lot. and. Um, there are a lot of great comments too and everyone's saying beautiful, fabulous, amazing. I'm sure you've heard this all before, um, but it is one of the highlights of every time that we tour anyone in the museum, visitors of all ages. It is the piece that they remember um, for sure. Um, so a lot of questions, of course, about your process and sort of techniques. Um, some people were asking, um, what is fuming? Do you use a torch? And of course, somebody wanted to know, did you mention the process of how you weave it together? <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't, we, we keep the weaving process a trade secret. We sort of like that there's, you know, the magic in there, in that um, it took us many years to create. And um, we would certainly love to take on some apprentice at some point and, and show, uh, uh, and explain the technique so it doesn't go with us. But um, so we, we the, you wanna talk about fuming? Yeah, so with the fuming aspect, um, it's about reactions and uh, different colors of glass have different elements in them. And silver is very reactive with other elements. Um, and so um, what happens when you add heat with the combination of the silver foil and another piece of glass, like you have to choose the right con that um, you know has a, a specific element in it there's a reaction that takes place with the heat and it fumes, it, it's like smokes. And that smoke from that reaction is what's um, adding that extra color to the glass. Great, and, and um, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, my chemical engineering background sort of you know, lent an interest to this type of reaction in glass. That was exactly one of the other questions. So <laughs> I know that, um, you kind of answered that already about how your science and engineering backgrounds have informed your work. Um, but also, um, some people wanted to know where the cherry blossom branch ended up. And did you do you make did you make more flowers? And I sort of wanted to know, how come what's the symbolism behind the sunflower with the dragon on the samurai? And I noticed you paired a flower with each one of the other samurai. Yeah. Well, each of the families, the, the samurai families had a, called a mons, which is like a crest, and it, it was associated with a flower. And so we loved the idea of the samurai, these, you know, these, you know, big ferocious, you know, sort of, you know, warriors being associated with a flower as well. So we did, we, as, you, as we, you know, we, we had the dragon or the dragonfly or the hawk or the, the koi fish, which are carp, which are a, a kind of a, a ferocious fish. Um, 
as, as the hard animal or the tiger, and then we have the flower juxtaposing with it. Did yeah, I... what, well, what's really cool too is, and we didn't know this until we started researching the samurai, is they kind of wear pajamas under their mm -hmm. um, armor, and those pajamas are floral. Um, in a lot of cases. So, you know, I think we we just really like the yin and the yang part of, um, you know, uh, of having that that flower and that Can you all see fierce now? Uh, animal. Can yeah, you all see it? it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So yeah, so that's the, there. yeah, so there's the pajamas underneath the, um, at the bottom. So you're saying they have floral undies on? That's a good way to put that. Maybe uh, we, could, uh, we can show uh, the cherry show the blossom. Or, yeah, let me uh, exit out of here, dogwood. find the, um, well, the yeah, dog. Do you know the, where, it, when the, where it ended up? Yes, the cherry blossom we installed. Here we go. Let's start with that right here. We also did a dogwood um, uh, for the Ritz Carlton in Tyson's Corner. So this is the cherry blossom that we sketched out. And then, oh, that's odd. Let's see, where are we? Oh, right. Where's the cherry blossom start? This one right here, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so there's the cherry blossom we did in paper. Uh, and then we made the, we wove the entire branch. It's a seven foot long branch. So those are all individual pieces that have a metal structure underneath them that have to all be sort of clipped in like, uh, like with keyholes. Um, and, and the cool thing is I don't think the, um, the cherry, um, blossom branches that far from um, the um, oh, it's just, it's two it's two buildings down from the Werners <laughs> in uh, in Florida. Yes, uh, the um, the folks who own this actually know the Werners and had been on the the Werners have had tours of their home and their art collection, and the owners of the cherry blossom have been in their home to see it. This is these are the these are the uh, the flowers that we made for the cherry blossom. And uh, we had to make 66 for it. And we they're made, all different. They're, every one of them is different. <laughs> they all have different centers. We make little, you know, different, different colors of, uh, uh, you know, different the colored uh, beads white. that are yep. down inside. And then that's, uh, that's it photographed in our studio. We put the chair and the lamp there just to show scale. Um, and that's a close up. And then there we put one of them, one of the 66 flowers, we put that little beetle that uh, you kind of, have to find if you're sort of examining. You see him right here. We thought that was just a little fun addition. So then we took this, Pismo also took this uh, to um, a, a Palm Beach exhibition. That's where we met the couple who purchased it. And then we went to their home and on a spiral staircase, we <laughs> installed it uh, with, uh, that's it looking from up Very above staring. and looking from down below. The marble stairs, we, yeah, we, um, it was, yeah, it was quite an adventure, but um, we, we had a lot of fun uh, installing that. So uh, it, it was just a perfect location. It looks beautiful. I love the, the beetle hiding. <laughs> yeah. um, there, there were some other technical questions. Um, how many times can you fire your glass and are you limited with the firing of your original glass creations and the times you fire it to slump it? And also people are asking about do you use a torch? Um, so good, good question about the firing. So glass will, it will start to what they call devitrify, which some of the minerals in it start to come to the surface and they, they're hard to clean off if you heat it over and over and over again, uh, especially with the fuming, as Eric said, partially, we have to, we, if you, the more you fume it, the more that fume just goes, covers the whole glass and changes the color. So fuming, we have to backtrack how many work times we're gonna fire the glass. So there is multiple times that we have to fire each of the pieces in the process, um, but- uh, It hasn't we, caused a problem. It hasn't caused a problem yet. In our early days, we had a lot of breakage because we didn't, we didn't understand the, the what they call the coefficient of expansion. When glass isn't solidly melted together, um, there was a lot, there's a lot of nooks and crannies and holes and air that goes in and out of our weave because it's very textured. So we had to control the, the, what they call the annealing process and to get all the stress out of the glass during the final firings so that we could keep it, um, uh, we could keep it intact and well, not, and not we, be broken. And, and, you know, we developed this process. So it's like, it was all about experimentation. It was like, you know, how long do we have to heat it? How quick can we heal it? you know, heat it, how slow do we have to cool it down when we heat it? 
because there's so much stress because we're keeping everything very textural and it's not flat. We have hundreds of pages of notes, Signa would remember that, uh, that we had to keep track of every color that we made and whether it was compatible with other colors. Um, you know, white and black glass is hard to melt together because white glass is very soft and white, or white glass is very hard and black glass is very soft. So you have to, you know, alter them a little bit so that they can uh, actually work together. And a lot of that we just had to learn on our own. Great, and sort of a follow-up to that is, um, do you typically work with the bullseye sheet glass or do you use furnace glass for some yeah, component? We, we uh, buy bullseye because it's a, uh, bullseye glass is all mined in the same uh, Washington State sand mine. So we have to have glass that's all the same. Like you can't take a Coke bottle and a, a, a beer bottle and melt them together. They'll probably break. So unless they were made in the same factory. So yes, we buy the same, uh, it's called uh, COE uh, 90, coefficient of ex expansion 90. There are a, a few other companies that make the, the COE 90, but we just stick with bullseye because uh, they have a greater range of color that we can begin with to make our hundreds of colors on top of. Great. Um, and then we have some questions. They want to know, does the samurai come with a sword, which I think is a great idea. And they <laughs> asked, have you been, have you visited Japan? I swear they asked that. <laughs> we, we, uh, I, I went to kindergarten and nursery school. Um, uh, kindergarten, I don't, I have to ask my mom now which one I was in Japan and when I was in Taiwan. My dad was in the military, so I'm a military brat. So I, I just always, I grew up doing origami. I grew up in our home. We had a samurai helmet that was on our, my mom's old sewing table. We had a little uh, kimo um, uh, a kimono, a little geisha in a, in a glass case. Uh, and a lot of the furniture that my parents uh, purchased over there, I sort of grew up around. So I've always been attracted to it. And I've Eric, never been to Japan. Yeah. And I love when people ask that question because it puts more pressure on the fact that we have to go there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> we, we always, it's always on our bucket list at the very top, but uh, somehow we've, it's eluded us so far. Um, and people want to know, um, I know you mentioned how many, like it took you about a year and even longer for the, for the first kimono, but someone asked how many hours, since you have so many notes, I'm wondering if you have an answer to how that many hours we, to create one kimono. We, we literally create our, our work. We, like when we make one of our table sculptures, we say it takes six weeks. So we really have never sort of had a, a log book of our hours. When we well, had, one of the, with the well, kites. Well, with the kites, we had to do, it that was, was our first public installation um, for the library. And um, oh, right here. Yeah. Um, for the library can you in all, Los can you Alamos, see that? New Mexico. And since it was for the government, um, we had to log the hours just in case they lost their budget. They would have to pay us for the work we'd done. So it was, but, but for us, it was yeah. kind of a pain to keep track. Well, of we, we did. I, I actually, I don't remember what the notes were, but we mm -hmm. had to, that was our, the first time we actually had to write them down because, you know, the county is spending, you know, it's the art and public spaces uh, budget. So they have to account for the money that they spend. So they, all the artists that, that they commissioned to do work in those counties, and I'm sure that's the way it is across the country, um, the artists are required to keep track. We have a logbook. I, I just never really, we never got to the point where it's, it's if they canceled the project that they would want those notes. Um, so I never really, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, it's like, it, it's, it we took like taking months. notes about the colors and the reactions, but yeah. keeping track of how long you're working, we didn't enjoy yeah, that as much. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and someone suggested that you should make a book out of the kimonos and it would be great to have all the science. And as an educator, I think for for any science student or you know, science enthusiast or chemist or something, you know, it would be great to have all those the connections between it. Um, and now that you brought this picture up, someone actually asked, do you make a woven glass bow tie? So well, it's funny you should say that, because we once we made the bows we were like, oh, that would be great on Wall Street. So uh, it, uh, we, we, we just have to adjust the fixture on the back that we attached it to the, st the string on the kite in order to make it sort of clip. We'd have to have some sort of a collar that had a, a structure to it that could hold the weight of it. But certainly that is a, a, I can't wait it's a to great idea. One. <laughs> yeah, one day we will, uh, that might be a product you'll see. And I know, I don't know if you have any pictures of this in here, but um, some people are asking how you transport 
the kimonos um, in uh, sections and the whole there is process. something to the to the obi bow. Maybe you can talk about the. Uh, where are we? Sh here we go. The so the 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 um, at the very beginning when we showed you the mannequin, the oh, yeah, there's background. boxes right here. So this is the three. Oh, I got to share the screen, right? Or no, play. Here we go. These three boxes are the three pieces of skirt that wrap around the base, and they each have their own box. They're 36 inch long boxes. So the the kimono comes apart in um, I, she's 17 pieces, and then we put her in a seven foot square crate that she gets shipped to. I'm trying to go back to a kimono shot so that we can we can uh, see the different pieces of her. So they all in 17 different sections, each kimono? Yes, it's the same. Let's see, here we go. Oops, I gotta do the same thing again. Um, so yeah, the sleeve here on both sides is its own piece. And then this, the, the shoulder comes off, that's its own piece, the this shoulder comes off. The back panel is all one piece. The bow comes off together in all five pieces. And then the skirt is three different pieces. And, and the front panel. The, and the front panel is two. The, um, let's see, where do I have the front here? Yes, yeah, so there's yes, the crossover like it's a robe. So uh, these two pieces come off as separate pieces. And then the belt, the obi bow on the front and back are two separate pieces. So they each get clipped on, you know, we do the skirt first, then the, the chest in the back, then we put this, the, the, um, the belt on, then the bow, then we hang both of the sleeves. Um, it's really quite the puzzle. <laughs> and, you know, having, and, and melting glass and then getting it to line up, uh, we have to line up both the fit so that it fits nicely and that the story and the, the lines of the, of the um, like here, the ray of sun, trying to get these to sort of line up when they're separate pieces that we're making um, is a bit of a challenge that we had to uh, sort of just learn in trial and error to, uh, to figure out how to do that. A lot of patterning. Great, so is it taking you um, less time or as or much time or more time to make the samurai? Uh, well, less time I think with the glass, but more time just because the, each of the, um, there's nothing like a deadline that makes you, you know, put the fire <laughs> under you to get you going. So because there's, uh, we don't have a, we haven't had a, we, we've been doing, we did every time, every year we had this, the, uh, we were committed to show the next um, kimono. So, but we've been making lots of other, we make lots of other sculptures, limited editions. We do custom pieces for people. Um, we're always busy with a lot of other uh, sculpture. So in our free time is when we, I've been working on the fire samurai um, and- And we've it, added new elements with the casting. So, yeah. you know, having that face, having the hands, having the feet. Um, Those are sort of new techniques. elements to try, try to figure out. Yeah, and he's seven and a half feet tall. Um, we, but we, um, so yeah. So the question is we want to get the, the all five samurai done We'd love to get them done in the next couple of years. We sort of try to set our own goal for that, but it seems like every time we get going, you know, we have a the problem that's a good problem to have that somebody calls and says, "Oh, can you make this?" or "I would like this table sculpture," or "I would can you do?" This? So we love that as well. So we sort of love that in our in our downtime we have the samurai to work on, but uh, um, we just have to push ourselves for every minute. But sometimes when we're it, when we've been in the studio a lot working on you know, the commission pieces, it's nice to take a break. And then when we're watching TV, we think, well, you know, we should be in the studio working on the samurai. <laughs> so that's a, that's just a problem with having your, where you work in your own home. I love the way you're samurais, your downtime project. <laughs> <laughs> that's truly what, what uh, he is, yes. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing it in completion. I think there's just one sort of final question, which I, um, they want to know how often do you have to start over on a panel and how frustrated do you get with that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, one story, we, uh, our winter kimono, we made the entire arm backwards and didn't realize until it was done that, and so that it didn't match up with the shoulder. So we actually literally had to start from scratch and make the whole shoulder again. And that's a complicated piece of glass to make. But we, and we had enough glass left over that we were able to do that. Um, but I think in the early days that happened a lot, we're pretty good now if we, we're good about if there's a breakage and we have to re redo a piece, we understand. 
but it happens far less now than it did at the beginning. But I will tell you that, you know, for young artists out there who are just starting out, it, there's a lot of times crying under the table and, you know, gnashing of teeth and throwing around things because you work six weeks on a project and the final polish in the kiln, it comes out and it's split right down the middle and you can't really figure out why. So it, 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 it's something that happened. We have what we call the boneyard in our garage, which are boxes of these broken pieces from the early days. And, but we found that we've used some of those pieces from the old, from the early days. We've been able to cut out shapes of those that we like that we applied to some of the other sculpture. So we have little woven medallions that we didn't have to make because we used a broken piece that we were able to recycle. So, uh, and we can also melt that down, but it's sometimes hard to, melt down something that you've spent, you know, six weeks weaving and making the fabric. And then all of a sudden you have to melt it down uh, and you're not really sure what color you're gonna get when all those colors mix together. And when we, we make the colors, you know, the reactions, they don't always turn out like we anticipate or expect. And so, but it's sometimes the great part of experimentation that you get something unexpected. And, um, you know, we can, add a little different flair, you know, using a different color or a different type of glass to correct what we, you know, didn't anticipate. Yep. Well, that's really great. Um, thank you for those candid answers. And I think that I want to thank you for all your time and your generous um, giving of your story. And I think that the last um, comment in the chat um, really sums up exactly what I was going to say, um, which I just lost the chat window, sorry, which is why I'm fumbling for a second. Um, but Tanya says, I've dreamed about the summer kimono and how it was made. And so she could sleep easily now. And I definitely <laughs> feel the same way. <laughs> so I really thank you. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing your journey with us and thank you for everyone for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much. And Tanya, thank you for that comment. That was great. And thank, thank you. you again, Ron, for the wonderful comments um, about flow. And Jody, uh, thank you for the invite. We're thrilled for all of, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, it was a lot of fun to have you in, into our home and show you a little bit of behind the scenes. Great. We hope we can visit oh, in I, person. I, I, I will say, I, I will say that if you have, um, we will answer anybody's questions that uh, uh, anybody has. If you want to, our website is wovenglass.com. And um, am, I, am I sharing the screen or not? Uh, no, you're not right now. But anyway, our, our website is wovenglass.com, and we are. Um, our email address is sales at wovenglass.com. But on our website, there's a contact page where you can, um, uh, you can just make a comment and, and we'll, we'll certainly get back to you. There we go. Yeah, I just typed it in the chat for you, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. oh there it is, so that's great. So yeah, so feel free to contact us if you have more questions. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to answer anything that you all have. And thank you so much for, uh, for spending the evening with us. Um, fill out the